So like Roy just said, uh, two years ago, uh, when I was still working on my master's work, uh, Cliff and I were, uh, some master's work was on uh, the evaluation of the CFS version to uh, the operational forecast model in the US on subseasonal forecasting. And so we were starting to think about next steps for my PhD work. So we were, came here looking for some inspiration. And through interactions with other people in the community and collaborations, uh, we settled on applying the idea of global convection permitting resolution um, and applying that to the problem of subseasonal forecasting. So as of today, we've completed three of our runs. Um, so I'm going to share some sort of cursory results from those. We haven't gotten into the process-based analyses yet, um, but we do have some pretty interesting results so far. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of background. Um, so plenty of papers, including uh, some of my master's work, has shown that subseasonal predictive skill in current operational models is fairly limited more or less to the first two to four weeks of the forecast, as you can see in these error saturation bars um, for the CFS at different time scales. Um, depends on the time scale, depends on the model that you're looking at, but generally we can't get well past a month. Um, and as we all know, uh, tropical convection is a very important driver of extratropical circulation via atmospheric teleconnections, um, and that is also poorly simulated in these really coarse resolution uh, GCMs. So we thought, well, maybe by going to convection permitting resolution, we can improve many aspects of the tropical convection on numerous time scales, and therefore improve the associated teleconnections, maybe also improve extratropical subseasonal forecast skill. So today, we're going to try and at least touch on a few different questions. So by going to convection permitting resolution, uh, can we improve the tropical mean states? And I'm putting mean state in quotes here for reasons I'll explain a little bit later. Um, can we better predict large-scale convective phenomena that heavily impact the extratropics? We're focusing here on everyone's favorite intraseasonal phenomenon, uh, the Madden-Julian oscillation. And then finally, we're just going to barely look at this, but we're going to see if we can also improve uh, extratropical circulation skill um, in these convection-permitting models. OK, so our tool, uh, like a lot of other people in this session, uh, is MPASS. We're using version 5.1, basically right out of the box. Um, while it does have variable resolution capabilities, we decided to go with a uniform mesh, as you can see here, um, except this mesh is at 120 kilometer resolution. Um, and we've gone down to 3 kilometer resolution, which looks like this when you plot that same map. Um, that's over 65 million cells in the horizontal, so it's quite a pain to work with. Um, and we're integrating our simulations for 28 days. Again, not to outdo Falco or anything, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we're using, like Falco, uh, we're using the convection permitting suite. That's the nice thing about MPASS. It comes packaged with these suites, except we are omitting the grell uh convection scheme. We're going without, with no cumulus scheme in our runs. Um, here's a picture of both my best friend and the bane of my existence, uh, Cheyenne. Um, so each of these runs takes about 2.7 million core hours, um, and each produces about 80 terabytes of output. So it takes, takes a little while to to get these done. We're still in the, we're in the process of running a fourth one as we speak. Um, so we're doing three different case studies. And each of these case studies features um, some instance of the Madden-Julian oscillation. Because again, that's sort of the tropical phenomenon we're honing in, honing in on, because a lot of papers have shown how it connects to intraseasonal phenomena in the extratropics. Uh, so our first case is the famous MJO2 from the Dynamo Field Campaign. You can see the precipitation in this Hallmuller diagram off to the right here, um, characterized by two eastward propagating convective packets. So we're initializing on November 22nd, 2011. Our second case, uh, you can tell the MJO has very different precipitation characteristics here. Uh, this one we're initializing on February 8th, 2013. Um, and we're choosing this one because this MJO has been shown to be uh, associated with a strong extratropical pattern in North America and in Siberia. So we wanted to see if we can capture that. And then finally, we're initializing on December 2nd, 2003, another prominent MJO event. Um, and then for all these three kilometer runs, we've also run 15 kilometer global simulations, um, but these are using the new TICA cumulus scheme. So we can compare something uh, more representative of current operational models. Um, we've used, used FNL analyses for initial conditions and for lower boundary conditions to be sort of analogous to uh, what operational models in the US use. Um, and importantly, we've actually fixed our SSTs at their initial value. We can talk more about that later uh, if you have any questions. Um, so because it's apparently a rule that you can't be in the session and not have an eye candy animation, we're going to show one very similar to what Falco has shown. Um, we're just showing the OLR from 
uh, our three kilometer dynamo simulation. So once again, it's pretty difficult to be able to distinguish this from a satellite image if you had the two next to each other. Um, but here we're focusing on this broad region of convection in the Indian Ocean. This is our MJO. You can see that there's uh, cyclonic circulations near the rear of it, those Rossby wave dryers. And we're sort of moving with the MJO here as it slowly crawls um, towards the maritime continent. Um, other details you can pick up here are the really complex diurnal cycle on the individual islands of the maritime continent, dominated by sort of alternating land and sea breezes. Uh, if you look in the extratropics, you'll probably find some cyclones at one point or another. Um, but as you can see here, which we'll talk about a bit later, our convection, our big packet of convection associated with the MJO, sort of getting hung up around the maritime continent region. And as, as we move beyond, you're going to see less of this propagating packet uh, enter the West Pacific. And maybe we'll be able to touch on that uh, a little bit later. OK, so the first thing we want to address is the tropical mean state. And I put mean state in quotes because, again, these are only 28-day runs. So you're not going to get something representative of the actual model mean state. You would need years of simulation to really get at that. Um, but because we have three of these runs, and actually the results are all pretty consistent with each other, um, we can at least get a hint as to maybe what some of the model biases might be. Um, so all these mean state uh, figures I'm showing are just from this first case, from the Dynamo case, because again, like I said, they're all pretty consistent with each other. So here we're just looking at uh, the average precipitation rate throughout the entire simulation period. On the top left, we're looking at trim. Uh, on the top right, we're looking at a CFS version 2 reforecast initialized at the exact same time um, because we want to compare to the actual uh, operational equivalent. Uh, bottom left is our 15 kilometer impasse, and then bottom right is our 3 kilometer impasse. Uh, at a cursory glance, it's hard to pick out uh, pretty strong differences between them. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out maybe in the 3 kilometer. Uh, is that in the uh, Indo-Pacific warm pool region, we're getting a lot more precipitation, it seems, than we've measured uh, in the trim. So that's one of the main features here. Uh, if we just go ahead and do a zonal mean, uh, maybe it's a little bit clearer. So the blue is trim, orange is CFS, uh, green is 15 kilometer, and then red is the 3 kilometer. So while we're doing actually pretty well uh, along the ITCZ, you see that here uh, along the equator, we have far too much precipitation in our three kilometer impasse run. And in, in fact, if you do an average over the entire tropics, 15 to 15, uh, it's about 10% too much precipitation. Um, so it's not too bad, but it's definitely worse than we're seeing in the CFS uh, and in our 15 kilometer impasse simulation. And again, this distribution looks pretty similar for all three cases, so we're not going to show all three of them. OK, so now what about the precipitation frequency? So now we're just looking at the percent of time during this 28-day period, uh, the precipitation rate exceeds 0.01 millimeters per hour. Um, so what immediately stands out is both in CFS and in our 15-kilometer impasse, we're seeing precipitation far too frequently when compared to trim. It's raining almost all the time. And this is a very commonly observed problem in models with parameterized convection. And we see that when we go to 3 kilometers, uh, we reduce that frequency by quite a bit. So this looks a lot more like trim uh, than the other two. Although, to be fair, 0 0.01 is very, very small. And we probably can't even measure those rain rates with trim. So this may not be a fair comparison. So maybe if we step up to 0 0.5 millimeters an hour, we can have a more favorable comparison. And again, in our parameterized runs, uh, we see too much tropical convection, while our three kilometer impasse actually looks pretty good compared to trim. Now, if we step up another bump, uh, we're now going rain rates above 5 millimeters an hour. So this is only our heavy rain rates. You can see the difference here is very stark. And again, this is a commonly noted problem uh, in models with parameterized convection. We're seeing almost no heavy rain rates along the ITCZ and in the warm pool in both CFS uh, and in our 15 kilometer impasse. It's actually interesting, in the 15 kilometer impasse, are actually getting more of these heavy rain rates in the subtropics where maybe synoptic forcing is helping out a bit, but the convective parameterization is not really producing any. Um, whereas in impasse, the three kilometer one, uh, we see plenty of uh, heavier precipitation. Though again, we're seeing too frequent uh, heavy precipitation in the Indo Pacific warm pool. This is possibly related to the bias that I showed a couple slides ago. Okay, another way of showing this is just showing a rain rate distribution. Again, black is trim. Sorry about changing the colors on you guys. And then green is our three-kilometer impasse, which, as you can see on this log-log scale, uh, it 
matches trim pretty well, whereas our other two models, like we've already outlined, have too much, too frequent light precipitation, and then too little heavy precipitation. OK, and then again, you see the same thing in cases two and three. OK, the last mean state feature that we want to look at here is the diurnal cycle. Uh, this is just UTC composite precipitation from the 15 kilometer and 3 kilometer end pass. Um, the main things you can really see here over the maritime continent are the complex diurnal circulations uh, over the individual islands. Um, we're interested in the diurnal cycle because not only can this make a big difference on a you know, deterministic forecast basis, but uh, the diurnal cycle also heavily impacts the MJO, which is, again, a feature we're very interested in. So we want to see if we can improve the intensity and or timing of the diurnal cycle over land or over ocean uh, by going to three kilometers. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. Again, this is case one. Um, we're seeing all of our ocean points in the tropics composited over here by local hour, and then all of our land points over here to the right. And uh, the main thing we can note here is that we see a significant improvement over the 15 kilometer impasse in both the amplitude and the timing uh, of the diurnal peaks over all the ocean points in the tropics. Right? We're bringing it up a few hours, and we're dampening the amplitude of that diurnal peak. Whereas over land, uh, it's a bit more of a mixed bag, but it looks like we at least get some improvement of the timing of the diurnal peak, although it's far too intense still uh, when compared to trim. And again, um, these are similar between the other cases. And if we were to just take the points in the maritime continent region rather than over the entire tropics, uh, this figure would look basically the same. OK, so now what about our second question? We're just going to look at mostly Hobmuller diagrams right now, because on a case-by-case -case basis, it's actually pretty hard to objectively track the MJO. That's something we're working on. Um, but yeah, so here we're looking at precipitation rate Hobmullers, uh, left panels, trim, CFS, uh, and pass 15 kilometer, and our 3 kilometer end pass over here. So the dynamo case uh, is characterized by two eastward propagating packets of precipitation. Um, if we overlay these lines over all the panels. It's pretty clear to see which one does the best job of capturing these waves. CFS does produce uh, an eastward propagating feature, um, but the phase speed is too, too slow. And there's not two distinct waves embedded within. Uh, 15 kilometer impasse sort of went off in its own world here and decided to produce westward propagating precipitation. We're not exactly sure why it's doing that, but that's going to be uh, a topic of research moving forward. And in the three kilometer impasse, this first wave is captured almost perfectly. The second wave may be a day late, but has the right phase speed up until it stalls over the maritime continent about two weeks uh, into the simulation, which is a common problem in global models, for those of you who know uh, about the MJO. One we are hoping to fix by going to three kilometers, but apparently the maritime continent barrier issue is still an issue in convective permitting models. OK, so I'm just going to highlight the waves that the models actually produce here. Uh, we can look very briefly at the dynamics. So here we're looking at uh, the low level zonal winds. Um, this is now CFSR that we're looking at. Um, and you can see pretty clearly that the three kilometer impasse captures the low level convergence associated with these two waves far better than the other two, namely because their precipitation was also in the wrong place. Uh, same thing at upper levels. Uh, the upper level divergence associated with these two waves is quite well captured uh, by the three kilometer impasse, although you see this sort of preceding upper level divergence uh, in the West Pacific ahead of the MJO. Maybe that has something to do with it stalling over the maritime continent. So that's something also to look into. Um, so you can sort of compile these all into the RMM index, which is actually not great for uh, characterizing the precipitation of the MJO, but on a, at least a global scale. It gives you an idea of how these MJO global scale circulations are produced. And the purple, which is our three kilometer impasse, um, follows the observations, which is the blue, um, much better than our two runs with parameterized convection, which dampen the RMM amplitude uh, pretty early on. So now we can take a cursory look at our other two cases now, finally. Um, so we're looking at our case two MJO, which is more characterized by very broad precipitation and is begun by this westward propagating feature at the very beginning of the simulation. And looking at all the other ones, it's really tough to say that any of them capture the actual eastward propagating signal uh, that we see in trim. They all like to hang on to these westward propagating features, but the actual precipitation connecting them is not very well captured. So I'm going to say that even our three kilometer impasse more or less failed to capture this MJO. Um, and we're going to skip to the RMM. Again, in the first two weeks, it looks pretty good, um, but th they diverge thereafter. And again, because it didn't capture the precipitation very well, um, I'm going to, yeah, I'm not going to give the three kilometer impasse this one. 
And then finally, uh, here's our third MJO case. Again, characterized very, by a very broad packet of precipitation moving towards the east. And this one, we have a pretty clear signal here. Um, both the CFS and the MPAS 15 kilometer primarily produce stationary precipitation, while on the three kilometer run, uh, we see this really nice, broad eastward propagating packet with even this sort of intense westward propagating signal that we see in trim. So um, compared to the other two, it does much better at capturing this event, um, which you can sort of see in the RMM, although the RMM is a little amplified in our three kilometer run. So the last question we want to at least touch on a little bit um, is how have we done in the extratropics? Now here we're just more or less looking at deterministic skill. Um, and we're interested in subseasonal time scale. So what we're looking at here are weekly averaged 500 millibar height anomalies in the PNA region, which is a region uh, largely affected uh, by the MJO. Um, so we're using CFSR as our sort of benchmark here. Uh, the top row is week one, second row is week two, week three, and week four. Um, if you can't see, there's these little uh, spatial correlation scores in the top right corner of each panel. So for this particular case, I'll go ahead and summarize it with a little bar chart. Uh, the three kilometer MPAS simulation does a better job at simulating the extratropical pattern than our other two runs in weeks two through four. Now, whether or not this is actually connected to the fact that it simulated the MJO better, that's a harder case to make because we don't really know what percentage of extratropical variability is controlled by the MJO, but it's something we also want to look into, trying to actually draw a bridge between the two, looking at Rossby wave source or something like that. Uh, for our second case, um, I don't want you to have to look at all these panels and all these R values. I'll go ahead and lay it out for you. Uh, the three kilometer impasse does not improve upon either of our runs with parameterized convection in weeks two through four. Um, whether or not that's related to the fact that none of them captured the MJO, again, something we would really like to prove. Um, and then finally for case three, um, I'll go ahead and just highlight the two weeks where we see maybe a little bit of improvement uh, over our other two runs. Uh, in the three kilometer impasse um, relative to uh, the analyses, but not too much improvement in week four. OK, so let's try and at least sum up a little bit of what we've gone over. Uh, have we improved the tropical mean state? Uh, I put an orange check mark for sort of yes, because we have improved certain aspects of the forecast, like the distribution of precipitation rates, the frequency of precipitation, and the diurnal cycle, but we've also introduced a bias. So. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll chalk that off as a half win at least. Uh, have we improved the MJO? Uh, in cases one and three, I think, uh, I think it's pretty definitive that we have. Uh, case two, maybe not so much. And then have we improved the extratropical circulations associated with the MJO? Maybe. Uh, case one, we had a pretty robust improvement weeks two through three. Um, but in the other two cases, it'd be sort of tough to make a case. So I guess what I want you to get from this is that there's a, it's a pretty sticky relationship between what's going on in the tropics and what's going on in the extratropics, even on subseasonal time scales. There's not really a one-to-one -one relationship between the two. Um, but we still hope that, on average, by improving tropical precipitation, we can improve what's going on in the extratropics as well. Right? So just to conclude, um, convection permitting resolution can improve many important aspects of the tropical mean state, but also introduces a bias. Um, in agreement with, uh, with a bunch of other, uh, the other studies that have implemented convection permitting resolution, um, we've also improved the MJO in at least two out of our three cases. Um, and again, global subseasonal forecast skill improvement is maybe not so clearly associated with whether or not you use convection permitting resolution, but we have a pretty small sample size here. And it seems to maybe be related to our MJO fidelity, and that's definitely a relationship that we want to strengthen in the future. Um, so I'm just going to throw up. There's so much we still have to do with <laughs> this output. And if anyone wants to work on it, let me know, and I can point you to it. Um, but here's some of the things that we are currently looking into. And with that, I'll take any questions.